Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us again today on The Avid Reader, brought to you by my bookshop, Wellington Square Bookshop. Today, our guest is Mary Roach. Mary is the author of many New York Times bestsellers. I have interviewed her for two or this will be the third, I think. Her books include Bonk, Packing for Mars, Gulp, Grunt, Stiff, Spook, and lots of other stuff, National Geographic and Wired, New York Times. She's won several awards, including the American Engineering Society's Engineering Journalism Award. However, she was the only entrant which reminds me on a tangent where I am want to go of my own championship in high school in the high jump. The other contestants had been notified that the meet was on a different day. So I won literally single footedly introducing before he did the Fosbury flop. But okay, I tend to do this. Okay, her latest book is Fuzz When Nature Breaks the Law, which will be published on September 14th, the same day as my appointment with my eye doctor. So Fuzz deals with nature's way of killing you, or at least maiming or poisoning you. We are introduced to bears, black and brown, elephants, leopards, monkeys, prominently macaques. Think Dexter in Night at the Museum, different species though. Danger trees, very nasty peas, that's P-E-A-S. Um, you always have to do that with Mary. Uh, birds and other sentient and semi-sentient beings out at various times to either attack or defend. You know, I've always thought of Mary's work kind of like a combination of David Sedaris and David Attenborough. And sometimes we read books and they teach us, instruct us. And sometimes we re read books that make us laugh out loud. And it's really cool that Mary does both. You learn and you laugh. And for me, at, at least, the laughter pulls you along quite nicely through the learning, which is great for like high school students, seriously. So I could tell some more stories about myself, but it's time to introduce Mary. Mary, thanks so much for uh, putting up with me for a third time. Oh, geez, I, I never get tired of it. <laughs> so I always wonder uh, who or what <clears throat> puts you up to these things. So I know you've talked about it a lot, but what was it this particular time? Well, I was casting around for a story, a book idea as I do. And I, it's never a tidy origin story. I wish it were. Um, for your sake, but I, um, I started off down the path of uh, wildlife forensics, not where the wildlife are the perpetrators, but where they're the victims. Uh, I, I went up to this forensics lab in Oregon I, where they uh, have this amazing hair library. You know, every species has five different kinds of hair and this like amazing woman who could, you know, take a hair and identify, you know, this is not what you think it is. It's being sold as this, but it's that it's, you know, uh, or sh she had, become an expert in identifying counterfeit tiger penis, which is sold medicinally uh, and of course, illegally. So I thought I was going in that direction, but as it turns out, you can't tag along with anyone on an open case, an open investigation. And I, I need to tag along, you know, it's just what I do. It's just not interesting to me uh, or as interesting for the reader. If I can't ha have these scenes and, and, and get to know the people and, conversation anyway so that was a dead end and then I, I kind of eventually came around to well what if what if the wildlife weren't the victims but the perps you know and that's a kind of a vexing question you know you have the animals that are breaking you know you, you name the law there's animals that do that but of course they don't know what the law is they're just animals being animals trying to get food trying to get a warm place to have their babies and you know you as the human have kind of provided this so now there's a conflict and then as it turns out, there's an entire science uh, uh, built around this called human wildlife conflict. And that was interesting to me because anytime there's a realm of science that I was unaware of, I get kind of excited. Like, oh, I wonder what, wonder what happens there. What are the labs like? What is the field work like? So that's how it all rolled out. Uh, that's how it generally happens with you, I guess. That's a good thing that tiger penises aren't generally a dead end because then there wouldn't be any tigers. But <laughs> true. So I like your, your research, you know, sometimes 
it's really pleasant, like when you're interviewing the lovely, beautiful Parisian scientist who's um, researching saliva, except for the gross saliva. But and then sometimes you're trudging around in like all kinds of semi nasty areas. You ever get scared, or do you just move ahead, not even thinking about, hey, I might be in danger? And seriously, in this book, you might be in danger. Uh, did I tell you the thing that I worried most about in this one? I was going to go out with a. Um, I did go out with a mountain lion researcher who was doing, uh, he's doing a statewide population count of cougars, mountain lions in California. And he said, if you're coming with me, you know, you, uh, we're going to be crawling through a lot of poison oak. And I'm really allergic to poison oak. And this completely freaked. I didn't, I wasn't worried about the mountain lions. I was really worried about <laughs> getting a really bad case of poison oak. That was, that was honestly what I, fretted about not so now, much on mountain lions not to, we, not were, to, we were close we were close we knew from the tracks that there were some in the area uh but you know i knew enough about the rarity of the attacks and also the fact that they uh, they're not interested in humans we're not their prey it's it's very very rare that they would attack a human as dinner i remember once i was taking a ride with this guy who really had a pee and we went off, he went off the side of the road and he inadvertently ended up peeing against uh, some poison oak. And it was very unpleasant for him. Oh, for that's horrible. Time. Yeah. No, that's I, awful. But yeah, I feel for that guy. I thought you were going to say, you know, because I, that is the one moment when I did, I went off in the woods to pee in this area where there were mountain lions. And because I know that you know, when you're peeing as a woman, not as a man, but as a woman, you're making yourself small, you're squatting down. So you look like an easier dinner. You know, you look like less of a threat. And there was a case where somebody who was, I think it was a man, not peeing, but crapping. I think and this is in Canada. Uh, the details escape me, but uh, he was attacked. So that was in my head. So I was a little nervous, a little bit. Yeah, remember, uh, well, obviously you remember, but in the bears, I forgot whether it's black bear or brown bear. I know the saying, what, what is it? Black bear fight, brown bear? No, yeah. what is it? I forgot. If it's brown, lie down. If it's black, fight back. But that's not very good advice as I, you, people can read about it in the book. But anyway. But you talk about making yourself as big as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. It's funny, um, Going back to research, and I guess we should start with bears. Oh, and then maybe laws against insects. But with regard to bears, um, it's funny. And these are your funniest areas. It's like when you're like appointed secretary and uh, you mistook, oh, yeah. <laughs> when you mistakenly took um, centimeters for millimeters. Tell that. That's oh, yeah, funny. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I was at this, um, uh, it's called the Wildlife Human Attack Response Predator Training. And this is a training for wildlife officers who uh, they're the ones that get called if there's a mauling or a killing and they sort of secure the crime scene and they collect evidence, et cetera. And there's, you know, they're doing stuff like looking for blood spatter patterns and they're looking for hair and they're examining the, the victim and doing all that. So we had a practical practice. They had set up these fake crime scenes with these soft touch mannequins that had been gored up and, um, doing all the things, collecting evidence. And there were like, there was a team of five of us. And the guy said, well, yeah, you'll be, you'll be taking notes because you're the writer. <laughs> so every time they go, well, you're really good at this. So you, you fill out, because you had to fill out these full evidence forms. There's like five different kinds of paperwork. And they're like, well, you're, you're a writer. So you'll be really good at that. And then you made the, the oh, was it the oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, in fact, I wasn't very good at that. I noted, I was noting the, the space between the inside, the canine teeth marks on the mannequin. And I wrote it down in centimeters, not millimeters, which would suggest that like a T-Rex had committed this crime, <laughs> committed this killing. So as it turned out, yeah, I'm not the person you want taking notes. And, and you know that's when I laugh out loud, and and just a few pages later, um, talk about <laughs> your comment with regard to the mannequin and the two dots on her back. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, well, we were examining 
the different kinds of injuries on these mannequins that had been, you know, they had been mocked up to look like attack victims, like people who had been killed by various types of animals. And they were talking about, okay, the difference between perimortem and postmortem, like you look for, uh, is there bruising or bleeding, which su would suggest this was the animal that attacked the person that made it rather than a scavenger. And they flipped the body over the mannequin over at one point, And there were these two like little divots. And I said, mm, that kind of looks like scavenging to me. <laughs> and they're like, Mary, that's from the injection molding when they made the mannequin. Yeah. Yeah, there was one woman who got all the answers right. And then you kind of like <laughs> screwed it all yeah, That up. wasn't me, yeah. Yeah, so, so this is when I, I laugh out loud and usually I'm reading in bed. And so this is when I shake my wife and wake her up and she doesn't <laughs> think it's nearly as funny as I've thought it. <laughs> I, I feel sorry for her. Do, do you ever laugh out? Do you ever laugh out loud when you do it? Yeah, you know what? I think that maybe once per book, I make myself laugh out loud. Um, I'm trying to think what it might've been in this book. I'll get back to you. I know but what it was. A, yeah. I know what? what it was. What? It was when you described the guy that was the rat killer and he was dressed to the T's. And then you you ask you talk about his bag, and then you said it's it either contained a rat or a something, and then you said sandwich, a sandwich, sandwich or a rat, and you went, I don't know which one of those it was, but it was so nice the way you said it. It was like very polite. <laughs> it's funny that that's what you zeroed in on. It was just that yeah, last that your observation. I don't know which that was. I don't know where I didn't. It was a little this tidy little metal box. Plus he had this really natty outfit for somebody who was a rat searcher and like board ships and calculate the number of rats often based on the amount of rat shit and oh he my. had this little yeah like brass he looked like almost like a bellhops uniform in this little metal box and i'm like i don't know is there a rat in there or a sandwich i don't i don't know which what i forgot what you said his hat looked like that was the best part too yeah a pilot i think it looked, looked like a like up an airline pilot would wear yeah yeah. So yeah. yeah, that was funny too. And then also when you said, I'm not pulling this out of my fecal bag. Oh, oh thank you. Yes, I was quite proud of that one. Yeah, yeah. you have to laugh. I mean, uh, <laughs> and, and because you and I are so, kind of similar in that fashion, I end up not talking about the science. So we should go to bear. Well, no, before we go to bears, talk a little bit about this absurd idea of an the 19th, 18th century of attempting to censure and prohibit um, these nasty little creatures from continuing to bother and berate the human race. Uh, well, in the going back <clears throat> even further, like 15, 16, 1700s, uh, the legal system, weirdly enough, was, con was, was one way that authorities tried to deal with the depredations of uh, usually uh, or a lot of insects, sometimes rodents. Uh, and and the, the, the case that I talked about in the book had to do with a town in Northern Italy where uh, when caterpillars were eating the crops, at one point they decided we will take legal action against the caterpillars. And they posted summons on trees near this land. And on the summons, it directed the caterpillars to appear in court on a specific day at which point they would be assigned legal representation. Obviously the caterpillars did not show up in court, um, but the, the, uh, the city fathers decided, well, we will, uh, what we will do is assign a plot of alternate land for these caterpillars. Well, by this point, the caterpillars had pupated, become butterflies, uh, were probably dead by then. So uh, it was an, interest, an interesting approach. I, it, and the way the author of this book described the reasons for it. It wasn't, it wasn't like they really expected caterpillars to march into the courtroom on the specific date and time, but it was a way to show the populace, we're in control here. We have, we can take care of all matters and we, we uh, even nature is subject to our control and our laws. And so it was kind of a way of just sort of the spectacle of power uh, is the way that author of that book, uh, interpreted it, but it was quite a bizarre. I mean, and it was, you know, animals were put on trial and sometimes put to death. I mean, and sometimes they were livestock and you, and then, you know, you would think in that case, it would be the owner of the animal that would be put on trial. 
or punished, um, you know, for negligence and something or something like that. But um, there was there was a time when it was the animals themselves that were put on trial and sometimes put in prison and hung. I mean, it was a very it was a very strange uh, way of dealing with problem wildlife. I remember when I was practicing law, I had a case Gibson versus 140 sheets of plate glass. I didn't <laughs> represent the plate glass, and we won. I think he was a gratuitous Bailey or something like that. And um, yeah. Um, so oh. bears. Wait, what, um, what did the plate glass do? Why was he? What? The plate glass was apparently on another person's property. Um, so it was trespassing. And he was the gratuitous Bailey. That is, he had the property, but he didn't ask to have the property. So somehow, I think I think William O. Douglas represented um, trees, a grove of trees, and oh, yeah. attempted to provide them legal status. Yeah, yeah. In, when I was in India, the um, someone told me that the current Prime Minister Modi had granted personhood to the Ganges River, which was kind of astounding. By that, you know, personhood. It doesn't mean the river got to, you know, get married and um, vote and things like that. It was just more of, I think, a way of protecting the river, I guess. I, I, I don't yeah. know any more about it, but yeah. Yeah, corporations are considered persons under the law. Oh, I'm doing this again. <laughs> I'm trying to sell the book. Okay. <laughs> so bears, let's go back to um, black or brown, black versus brown bears. And is Yogi Bear a a black or a brown bear? And what about Boo Boo? Boo Boo was blue, wasn't he? Is it Boo Boo yeah. blue? Well, blue you have a picture. Yeah, you have a picture of Yogi in the book. I know, it's not a color picture. I'm going to say Yogi's a, brown, a black bear. That's what I'm going to say. He's a very American bear, and we have more, we have more black bears. So tell, and, tell, us the tell us the difference in how you go into that. And oh, well, okay, yeah. yeah, well, the difference, uh, you mean in terms of what you do if, you're, if you encounter one? And also their personalities. Well, they're, uh, I mean, they're, I don't know that much about the different personalities of gri a grizzly as a brown bear. You, when people say a brown bear, it's often they're talking about grizzlies. So brown bears, uh, you know, the bigger, more Northern uh, species. Uh, we, you know, our national parks, we have a lot of, a lot of black bears. So, so the, the, when it's black fight back, when it's brown lie down, uh, is not very helpful because a lot of brown bears are more black in color and a lot of black bears are brown. So that's not a good way to tell them apart. Also, it's not really, by, by species is not the best way to determine what your course of action should be. It should be, is this a predatory attack, which is very, very rare, or is this a defensive? Is this, did you startle this bear and it wants you to back off? In which case the bear is just bluffing. It's gonna just, run at you and try to look really scary, but it's not gonna follow through and attack you. So in that case, you wanna look, you know, look, look, look big, ha yeah, uh, uh, back away slowly, just uh, uh, not, uh, not, not necessarily even look big, but just sort of don't, you know, don't seem like a threat. So just let the bear know that you're mm, just backing off doing what it wants you to do. If, if you, if you're, you know, if you're in a situation where the bear is, where, where an animal like, you know, like mountain lion or something seems to be bent on attacking you in that case, do everything you can. If it's actually coming at you and jumping at you, then, you know, try to, you know, go for the face, do whatever you can to fight it off. If it's really bent on attacking, which is yeah. very, 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 very rare. Yes, and your your um, wildlife officer who was attacked was I can't remember whether it was a mountain lion, cougar, and bit through his shoe. And yes, <laughs> and then he asked yeah, the guy, what, <laughs> "Oh yeah, what did he... he got well, yeah." Well, he was it was a it was a weird scenario because he got a call that this couple, this old couple in a house, this is up in Canada, rural Canada, uh, that there was a cougar like stalking them from the you know they're in their house. And they, they were claiming that this cougar was stalking them, which is very, very odd for a cougar. So I think he kind of didn't take it that seriously. He got out of his truck with, he didn't have a weapon. And he's like knocking on the door and he looks over and like, there's the cougar. And they like ears, ears flat, tail switching. And he's like, uh oh, the cougar jumps, sinks its teeth into his shoe. And he's dealing with this and he's trying to, he's like yelling at the people, like the old guy in the house. He's like, 
I need a knife. I need a knife. Get me a knife. And the guy's like, it's, I don't what kind of knife? It's in the dishwasher. <laughs> Hold on. He's like, any knife, any knife. <laughs> the thing about knife. like, the thing about like trying to be rational. I mean, pretty, it's pretty hard to be rational when you, the adrenaline's in, you are in strict fight or flight mode and you're like an antelope or a, yeah. a cow. I mean, you don't, a cougar is going to run a long time chasing you and you're not going to run nearly as fast. Right. And I think that's the way most people respond is just take sure, off. Yeah. And that's yeah. This was a cougar because it, you know, cougars in California, like a, a decade will go by without a single fatality. They're just, we're not on the menu. They're, we're, we're not what they eat. Um, but this cougar in the case of the, um, the guy who knocked it on the door, uh, they found out after, because he did prevail, he was able to kill the cougar before it killed him. And they found um, that the stomach of the cougar was blocked, like it was starving. So it was very weakened and it was in a, a position where it was like, you know what, these two old people inside this box, I could probably do them. I could get them. So it was, it was not a typical cougar scenario. And then in all these situations, there are these two competing positions about if if there's attack should we kill the attacking animal or do we let it go because it wasn't explain how that concept works and it, it runs throughout your book especially with elephants sure um, yeah well yeah you know I, I spent some time in india where india is a you know culturally their take on animals and what should be done about them is is influenced by the fact that it's a hindu country and a lot of the gods are portrayed as animals or their spouse is an animal or they're riding an animal. So there's this lovely kind of connection with wild animals and nature um, for everybody that they're sort of immersed in. Um, so there isn't the sense of quickly deciding, oh, just kill that thing. You know, that there's, there's um, a more measured process. But, it, but the, the problem with some of the animals, for example, monkeys, because there's Hanuman, the monkey god. So people both are vexed by these urban monkeys, which create a lot of mischief. And, and uh, um, but on the other hand, they give them food as an offering, kind of, you know, because the monkeys all hang out by the Hanuman temple where people go in and make offerings, but then they come out and they give food to the, to the monkeys that are hanging around outside, kind of like a live version of Hanuman. So they both want, the problem to go away, but they are they are creating the problem by feeding these animals. Uh, so, yeah. but but in general, they they have a very um, it it's very it's very difficult for the the authorities in, in say in Delhi to get anything done because people are very resistant even to to trapping and relocating the monkeys. Like nobody wants that job to be a monkey trapper. It's just, you, it's a, there's a lot of stigma attached to it. You just don't mess with a monkey because, because you know, Hanuman, they're like, you, you, you revere and, and give offerings to them. And so it's an interesting uh, conundrum. In a much more simple vein, and, and, and I thought funny, it's funny you're talking about Hindu, in a much more actually Zen approach, you have the one rancher who says, Whenever there's livestock, there's dead stock. Yeah. I thought that was such a logical, intelligent way to respond to all of this. Yes, she was, she's that rare mix of a rancher and an animal activist. <clears throat> and she, she was talking about coyotes in particular, and which some, you know, they'll prey on, if you have, keep sheep or goats, you may have coyotes taking some of the animals. But she said, well, yeah, but you're going to lose some to disease. You know, you're, you're, you're going to lose some. If you have livestock, there's going to be some dead stock. She had a very, uh, it's just, it's the cost of doing business uh, approach to it rather than God damn varmints, <laughs> you know, just a different, uh, different approach, which I like. And then, and, then like and, and then there's animals like goats that you wouldn't think of as, you know, being bothersome, but I didn't know that, and I didn't even understand it at first, why and that was something that people would be. Talk a little bit about goats. About goats? Oh, well, yeah. goats? Did I write about goats? Oh, no. Um, 
I know what it was. Yeah, was it goats that they put the the strap oh, the on? Harness? Yeah, so they, the harness. Yeah, the harness. No, they they the goats. Yeah, the reason they they were um there was some researchers they were trying to. These are wild goats, and they were trying to do a population count, uh, trying to figure out and and one way you can try to figure out how many animals there are is by looking at how many little piles of turds. Like you can do a, a pellet survey, sort of looking at the numbers, you know, it's basically poop as proxy for pooper. So in order to figure, they had to, but to do that, you need to know the animal's defecation rate. Like how, uh, uh, so part of the research was to, you know, get that baseline. So somebody was trying to figure out, okay, well, we'll put a little harness on the goat to collect the poop. And so yeah, that there were, yeah, that's what you're referring to. Right. And, the, and there was a problem because it was a leather harness and some of the other goats would eat the harnesses off their buddies. So that. yeah, I have a goat named Beatrice. She's very nice, but she tends, you know, I go up before I go out and talk to her. And um, yeah, we have a good, good relationship. And, <laughs> but, but she tends to eat my shirt sleeves without me knowing. And usually it's when I'm going out somewhere where it's, I don't know, yeah. black tie optional or something like that. And then I don't really worry about it. I don't change, but I am do, not at the end. Of does Beard, do you have Beatrice to, for, because she keeps the plants, she mows the lawn or? She has her own. They have their own. It's three goats, her, her children, Star and Stripe, because they had when they were born, one had a stripe, one had a star. Uh -huh. So Beatrice, Star, and Stripe, and then the alpaca, who's nameless, but has kind of joined them and I believe thinks she is a goat. <laughs> Along with the peacocks and... Uh, there, I'm talking about me again now. So... Um, That's okay. I'm tired of talking about me. Let's talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is difficult when you're asked the same questions every day. You no, know? but you're not asking the same questions. This guy I know. just, and you just I get tired did. of hearing yourself talk. So I wanted, also, I was curious about Beatrice. Yeah. She's lovely. She's yeah. a beautiful fawn colored and uh, she's very pleasant and likes, she really likes to communicate. But she's, got those, right. she's got those weird rectangular pupils though. Yeah, like that's really kind of weird. Out, kind of creepy out, yeah. right? Yeah, it's kind of alien. Yeah, kind of alien. Not, Are they the only uh, ones that have a square pupil, right? Yeah, I think so. I've, yeah. I've never seen one on any of my other creatures or any I people. They, I think they are, I think they are an alien race. Watch out for Beatrice. You don't know what she's up to. Oh no, I'll go up there and I'll go up there sometimes in the morning and the goats and the alpaca and the chickens and the peacocks and the dog are all together and they're talking. And I know they're plotting against me. Of course I they know are. they're thinking of something that they can do to me and it's very irritating and scary, but. Yeah, yeah, they're having a conference. They're formulating a plan. Yeah. Yeah. The, well, if, the if peacocks, I, don't... I didn't. When I got the peacocks, I didn't know they lived to be forty. So they're going to be at my what? funeral, laughing at me. I hate them. Oh my them. God! They live till. Wow! I had no idea. Yeah, they're not. I wouldn't have gotten them. I hate them. <laughs> they hate me. I hate them. They're indestructible. They're loud um, too, aren't they? Oh yeah! If anyone sleeps over our house, that's it. One time, it's like mm -hmm. someone's honking a Volkswagen horn for all night long. Yeah, I used to work in a zoo. There was really? peacocks. Uh huh. Yeah, I worked at the San Francisco Zoo. Oh, huh. so there were peacocks roaming around, but they weren't as loud. As the Simangs were the loudest. Really? Simangs. They have this weird throat sac that that they puff up, and it, I don't know, projects their calls all over the zoo. It's quite impressive. So between them and the peacocks, it was quite a racket. Yeah, I was at that zoo one time, and I was with my daughter, who was always embarrassed by the things that I do, and I started making hyena noises and the hyenas joined in and it was really, really loud. And this one of the employees came over and said, what happened? And I said, I, I have no idea that they started doing this. <laughs> you disturb the hyena. You know, yeah, the hyena, the hyena gives birth through its clitoris. What? Seriously, seriously, no. in fact, it's true. Look it up. There's a hyena research facility up at Berkeley near here and I, I mean they didn't tell me that but somebody knowledgeable i think you're making that up no look it up i'm gonna look it up seriously okay since we're done All right. i might i yeah i mean it's not in any of my books i haven't fact checked it but 
I, I'm pretty sure it's true. I figured it would be in your TED talk on orgasm because it sounds, I wonder. Well, yeah, I know. It didn't make the cut. It didn't make the cut. But it is an interesting fact. So. The other funniest thing in your book was when you're talking, we can talk back about it, but stop starting and pronking. And you said pronk, you actually said pronk was your favorite, I think it's your favorite word in the book. And of course it is because it's exactly like a title of your book. Yes, like pronk. That's, yes. that's a title that you would have, pronk. That, yes, anything with a one syllable and a K, yep, is, is prime Mary Roach book title territory. So pronk. Oh, show your book, show your book oh. title. I mean, your oh. cover. I don't know if my, I'm, I'm connected here. Hang on, I have to move my, Laptop is on the laundry basket. I'm pulling the laundry basket closer. There we go. Now pushing the laundry basket back. There it is. There you go. Fuzz. There you go. Fuzz. Oh, yeah. There's That's not an too many actual books. patch that exists. We had these patches made for a pre order promo that uh, it, it's, it, it's um, life size, it's a real patch. So did you, you get can, one? Did, did you get a real patch? Did they give you any award when you were done with the, the outdoors courses? Like they a, gave me a certificate. I have a certificate. Yeah. Yeah. Is so it for is it, ex, you should frame no, it? No, it's not. I should frame it. I know, but I didn't. Yeah. Well, um, I'm not that far gone. <laughs> there's not too many books that have two Z's. That's a good title. I know. That's why I was pretty excited about the word fuzz. What other is there? What other book? Can you name fuzz. another book? With that has two Z's? Buzz Lightyear, but that wouldn't be a title. Oh, yes, that's a movie, right? See, yeah, that's I'm the only Twist, one. I'm going to. Books, yeah. Books that have double consonants. That's how I'll start. Books have double consonants. No, no, no. It's going to be a double Z. There's no, no other. What other, what other, what other word is there? Buzz. Okay. Maybe there's probably a B book called Buzz. This is not selling your book either, you know. Uh, yeah, well, maybe it is. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Well, it's funny, you know, because having a bookstore, everyone says to me, no, everyone says you can't judge a book by its cover. But every single person who comes into that bookstore judges every book by its cover. No, I That's know. It's you're... true. I know. I know. I'm a, I, it's like wine. I buy, I buy, if, if somebody could, somebody will say, you know, this is a really, you know, at the wine store, this is a, I really recommend this wine. It's a great deal. Uh, it's amazing. It got great scores and wine spectator and i'll be like it's an ugly it's an ugly label i'm not gonna buy it someone told me never buy a, a bottle of wine that has an animal on the label oh really huh yeah never oh because it's bad wine yeah like yeah, that they're kangaroo. trying to they're trying to sell it oh sh the, yeah 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 sh that's shiraz yeah what is it with the yellow kangaroo yeah yeah yeah, yeah well, it, i can't remember um oh let's move on okay about the, <laughs> this has been like 10 minutes of wasted time for you i've enjoyed it i um, know it's not wasted time it's it's fine it is fun too so um talk about the non some of the non-animal let's talk about danger trees that was the coolest part i i love that uh, yeah i like that part because i i just like the combination of danger and tree is was hilarious to me. It's like danger mitten, you know, or danger powder puff. A, you don't think of trees as dangerous, but um, there are people whose whole job is dealing with dangerous trees. There are danger tree assessors. I spent time up in, there's a grove of legacy trees. These are like 500 year old Douglas firs up in outside of Vancouver. And they, uh, people pay money to see them because they're big and majestic and gorgeous. But when a very, a very big old tree starts to die, uh, it's a slow death. And at a certain point, it starts to rot from the inside. It's not necessarily easy to see that. And when it starts rotting, now this big tree, uh, it, it could fall. And if there's a windstorm uh, and it falls in the direction of the parking lot or the trail, because this is a lot of tourists come through here. Uh, so they have to balance the, you know, the, the desire to have these beautiful trees for people to see and walk amongst with the danger that one's going to fall over and kill a few people. So that's why they have a danger tree assessor. And then if he determines a tree is too far gone and it's really a risk, uh, then they'll bring in the danger tree faller blaster. And I'll, I'll let people read the book and 
learn about what that's like. But um, anyway, I spent some time with the danger that was, that was, people. That was really fascinating. Yeah, yeah, and was, the interesting, yeah. yeah. The interesting thing is like how people would come by or the Sierra Club kind of, and they would criticize these people who are actually doing good for nature. And they would yeah. just think they're felling beautiful old trees. And the cool thing was that you said you could still look up and it didn't look any different. Right, they'd just blast off the top. And then the, the other thing, because so they're so tall that you would have to have binoculars to really see that the top isn't there. And that makes it more lighter, more stable. It buys you some time before uh, the tree is, uh, it, it, you know, you can keep the tree and still have it be safe. But the other thing that happens is that rainwater comes in the top and the tree kind of hollows out from the top and then the animals can live in it. So it becomes, uh, they, they call it a wildlife tree. because it, It's real estate for different, a lot of different kinds of animals. So um, it's actually beneficial in that way. But anytime you have a combination of blowing something up and the fact that it's nature, you know, that seems off-putting to people. And it's just, it's just they don't, they don't understand the nuance of it because why would they? They're just walking through the forest and they see some guy like blowing up the top of a tree and they're like, oh, you can't do that. But um, I think if they understood why it's being done and the fact that these are dying, these trees are dying anyway, just, you know, Douglas firs, they die really slowly. It's like a hundred you know, if your lifespan is 500 years, you only spend 100 years dying. So they, I know. Yeah, they, um, it happens uh, pretty slowly. But anyway, they are trees that are on the way out anyway. But people, you know, they just see it and they think, that man is blowing up this beautiful tree. Stop it. I have a, I have a tree called a cucumber magnolia. And it's the biggest one. And it's a champion tree. But my ex-wife told me not to tell anybody about it because I don't really like people and she said if I tell pe people about it they'll all come up looking at it she says you tell someone you have a champion tree it's like telling them you have a big you know penis it's like the same <laughs> I wouldn't have made that connection but oh, it's like now driving they, a, like so driving like when a you Lamborghini. tell people that you have a big penis they drive up and they want to see it I could yeah they're like hey I came here I heard you have a big penis can you show it to me and yeah I made an appointment <laughs> A, cu a cucumber magnolia is it called that because the fruit looks like a cucumber or is the tree somehow uh i don't know do you pickle do people pickle it how is it cucumber no oh, they have it has a fruit in the springtime that is uh, red and it's very like that yeah oh. and people are surprised by it but then it got hit by lightning and i've been trying to protect it ever since so i called up bartlett tree service and they came out and i said you think it's going to die? And they go, yeah, but you are too. <laughs> well, okay. Well, if you put it that way, so there you go. I felt better about it. So you talk, going along with the tree thing, you talk about organizations that presumptively are in favor of taking care of animals and endangered species, but then actually are only doing it in order for them to go out and kill them and hunt them. And you mentioned a few organizations. Is Ducks Unlimited like that, or are they really good? I can't remember. Uh, there's a couple. I don't, oh, I guess I guess you're talking about. Um, well, there's there's certain like here in California, we have a out in the middle of the state. There's a lot of really beautiful wetlands where um, a lot of birds and snow geese and you know, like 15 different amazing species of uh, migrating birds will stop over on their way uh are they going north or south anyway they stop over and there's a lot of them there and people go out there and it is a gorgeous plot of land um the the situation there i mean this is this is land that was set aside by um the state wildlife agency in, in part for duck hunting so there and there are little you know hunting clubs nestled in and among this land um but i have to say you know even though there is some irony there uh, that you know the the numbers if you've been out there it's just the huge the, the numbers of birds there's a tremendous number of birds so you know the hunters there's a limit on on how much they're taking but the thing that stayed with me is when i was driving back from this quite beautiful uh stretch of land is that this is what california used to 
look like. And now, you know, you pull away from this, these areas and then you're into the Central Valley, which is just all agriculture. It's just one monotonous, flat plot of agricultural land. Uh, so it, it is kind of nice that these patches were of, of California were set aside and are kept wild. It is ironic that the reason they originally were set aside was so that there would be always something to hunt for hunters. But we as birders, I'm a birder, uh, benefit from it as well. I mean, it's probably not the, the best way to do it. There should be conservation of land for conservation's sake, but this is the model as it was born and as it still exists to a certain extent today. But it's an interesting, it's an interesting scenario, yeah. When you, it's interesting when you talk about the birds, I think at one point you use the term, the word um, murmuration, and those have always fascinated me because I can't understand how it's possible for them to know. You know what I mean? It's almost yes, no, I know. The mur murmuration of, uh, you know, that these giant flocks, I think it must be sort of like, and I'm, I don't know, I'm just pulling this out of my eagle bag. <laughs> um, I you say this stuff, you know. Uh, I think it must be, you know, the blue angels, the way they do what they do. What I'm told is, and again, I don't know if this is true, but what I've heard is that you as the pilot, unless you're the middle person, you are looking at the, you're just lining yourself up with the person next to you. You're not looking ahead. You're just staying with the person next to you. So I assume there must be something like that with the birds where they're following the bird in front or I don't I don't know because otherwise it would just be chaos they just be bashing into each other how do they not bash into each other it's kind of amazing I read this I read this tragic and heroic story maybe it's apocryphal I don't know but it was like five blue angels and they follow the lead guy into and the, the lead, ground uh -huh. yeah they just augured in because yes. and and they probably knew what was going to happen they just did what they were supposed to do I don't know they might not if they're just following the looking at the you know matching their wing oh, yeah, right. with yeah. that guy's wing they might have had no idea uh, until they hit the ground and even then probably no idea so it reminded yeah, me of, it reminds me of what's happening in america right now yeah um yes. so i didn't driving I, into I was, the ground yeah we are pretty much um coconut coconuts what i don't understand is how are you able to get the exact number of people all these a statistics paper. you use. There's a, there's a research paper. Somebody, scientists went and they did the research and they published a paper that was peer reviewed and everything else. It's in the journal of, I don't know what the hell it is, but there's, I found a paper. I looked it up on PubMed, I think it was, or Google Scholar that has all the journals. And I looked up coconuts and deaths and there it was. Somebody did a paper and, and that information is in my book. I always wondered okay. about that, honestly, how many people are killed by falling coconuts? Because you sit on the beach, you're like, this is not a smart place to sit. There's a two pound object right yeah, over your head it, that's going to fall. You know, it's going to pick up a lot of speed and drop dropping from that tree and hit my head. I remember one time I picked up a ladder, not realizing that there was a hammer on the top of the ladder and fell off and hit me in the head. Ouch. And that's as close as I've come. I was very upset with the guy who laid it there, but he was drunk at the time, which is why the wall he was building in his house was completely <laughs> crooked. And then his wife came home and made him tear down the wall. So he, you know, he got what he deserved. I, I was once killed by a falling rock saw. I was up in the Arctic reporting packing for Mars, and they had a little Quonset shed where they had computers set up. And I was sitting at this computer, you know, and, and, to the left of me and up was a shelf. And somebody, there was a bunch of vinyl banners that had been stacked up and somebody put a rock saw, which is a, I don't know, 70 pound heavy thing on this stack of slippery vinyl uh, banners that had been folded up. And I'm sitting, I'm working on the computer and suddenly, whoop, this thing felt like missed me by inches. And the weird thing is that there was a, a webcam set up so if anybody had been watching, they would have seen me just my head bashed in by a, I mean, it didn't happen, but if it had, it would have been caught on the webcam. It's weird? interesting how you have those moments in your life where everything, it's so close. It is. You, yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah, I've had a few of those. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Maybe that maybe was the nine lives thing. I think I'm on number seven. Or else maybe you just split off and go into a, another random universe. You actually get hit, but you just <laughs> split off. Your consciousness goes flying off. I always thought that could be possible. But or, oh, or the other thing that's really good about your book is that it's fun. You barely do it, but at the end of each chapter, you kind of have a slight segue into the next chapter. I do. So you do that on yeah. Oh, thank you for noticing that. Of course, I I try to, I try to have some kind of you know flow from one chapter to the next, so it's not just completely. And I, yeah, I do want to kind of have the book kind of move in a certain path, so it's it's, it's not just randomly thrown down on the page, close but not entirely. <laughs> the other the other one was the chapter on legumes and other plant stuff that we, well yeah you had yes because you talked about maybe in even that room you have plants that you had to think about because you realized they could kill you oh yeah right there was a a, um, a list of uh common house common garden plants that are um, major toxicity and i looked at the list and we had something like nine of them in our yard at that moment they're incredibly common i mean of course you have to know how to extract the poison and and there's no reason why you just be eating large amounts of say hellebore or lantana or even i think rhododendron even Bach, yeah. Uh, yeah yeah like uh but yeah the uh, because of you know a plant is uh it has to defend itself and it can't it doesn't have teeth and claws it can't run away so what does it do it it poisons you know it poisons people after all, after all people. this research and you have like kind of categories between animals, trees, plants. Do you ever think about sentience, semi-sentience? Do, do, do you ever feel that there's actually some either self-awareness with either the trees or the plants? Well, I notice with plants that if you repeatedly cut them back on a certain side, they'll stop, they'll go, okay, this is a waste of time. Let's just grow on that side. Forget about that side. It's not working for us. She's just going to cut us back. Obviously, they're not thinking that, but they're definitely adapting in that way. You're almost, they're almost trainable. You know? and so I do, yeah, I do think about that. Not that they're sentient in the same way that we are, but they are communicating and they are adapting. Yeah. I always saw when I, from the very first time I read anything you wrote, I always thought you would write a book called Roach. I thought about yeah. it. Yeah, I did. I thought about it because a lot of roach, there's a lot of interesting roach research. Roaches are. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I, I, it's a good idea. I thought it was maybe a little, a little narrow, <laughs> but uh, I'd have to look into it. But um, I mean, as a topic, I don't know if, do how many people want to read 250 pages on roaches? I don't know. I, but you're right. It's a good I, it's a good I idea. I would because they're like, you know, when nuclear holocaust strikes, yeah. they will survive. You know, they, they, yeah, they will. They evolved and then they said, just like you said, they said, they, this is fine. We don't yeah. need to change. Yeah. We're cool. And that's the way they've been for 300 million All right, years. Well, I'm going to, maybe I will one day. And I'll put, you in, the, I'll put you in the acknowledgments. Uh, yeah, in a roach book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you, it's a good All last right, I'll name. Dedicate, I'll dedicate it to you. Even better. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, well, this is a question. That I, so I have to veer back to a Terry Gross question, which is, what are you working on now? Which I never like to ask. Oh, but. yeah. No, I, I, uh, I, an another book. <laughs> not, it's not about roaches. It is actually not something I've even submitted, uh, the, the proposal that is. So I, um, I, I'm not really talking about it yet because I don't even know if it will be a book, but I am working on it. Do you have the one word, one syllable title it's yet? Not, it's not one word and it's not one syllable. No. What? Two. You can't do that. Well, yeah, you did. You did with Mars. I am. Uh, I so can't do it. Just watch me. Just watch me. I'll do it again. I did it once and I'll do it again. This book was supposed to be Animal, Vegetable, Criminal. And we had to change it because of Mark Bittman's book. Animal, oh. Vegetable, Junk came out in February. And Norton said, well, it's too close. It'll, yeah. seem, it'll seem like you stole his idea. Anyway. Yeah, but you still can do whatever title you want. You can write a book called Gone with the Wind. But yeah, it wouldn't be smart. <laughs> you could. You're allowed Gone to. Gone with the Wind. You can't, 
You can't copyright titles. I know. Yeah. But my, you know, I listen to my publisher. They've been good to me. Yeah, they have been good to you. And yeah. I don't do you vet the covers or do you do you get a choice or something? Well, they're choice? really good about sending me different iterations and getting my input. I mean, ultimately I don't have right of refusal in my contract, but it's never been necessary. They've been they've been very good with that. Yeah, they get good people. That's great. Makes a big difference. Um, it does. Oh, it does. So I think we I think we get your book in. You know, in a box that says do not sell until. So I think it's coming. And then my manager thinks I open them. I always open them and take them out. And she thinks it's illegal. And she's always afraid <laughs> I'm going to get arrested. Oh, like the tag on the pillow? Oh, yeah. yeah. Do not yeah. Under, do yeah, not yeah. remove under penalty of law. Exactly. My bro yeah, my brother and I did that. And we thought we were going to go to jail for the rest of our lives. I did too. I did too. See, there's two kinds of people in life, the people who rip off the tag and the people who don't. <laughs> I'm definitely a tag ripper offer. Likewise. Okay, we can end with that. That's a good ending. We've, talked for, we've talked for about an hour. So yeah, it was yeah. so nice finally getting to see you and talk to you this I way. I know, I know. It's great to put a golfer's face to the- Shut up, jeez. <laughs> that was before we started recording. You're not supposed to do that. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Okay, that's your problem. Yeah, I'm gonna go out and play 18 and then go <laughs> get drunk. You don't look like, for the record, on on record on the recording, you don't look like a golfer. Yeah, and wear white shoes. And besides, and white... There's, not, there's nothing wrong with looking like a golfer. There's room for yeah. all looks in this world. Yeah, but then we're wearing white shoes and a white belt and going to the bar and talking about mutual funds and stuff. I'm, you yeah. know, yeah, I you can do the Tam O'Shanter and the Knickers look. Yeah, like that one golfer who always gets in trouble now. I forgot his name. Oh, the guy who went. <laughs> um, okay, are we done or what? I think we're done. I got to go eat some. Uh... <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, before we go, I'm fasting. And the reason I'm fasting oh. is because I have to go to this wedding on Friday. And because of uh, COVID, I haven't worn a suit. And I forgot that I was getting fat. So I tried <laughs> to pants on it. And I, they, I, there, there's no way. So I figured if I fast for two days or three days, am yeah, I going to be do. able to do it? I will. Do it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. You'll All be right. good. All right. All right. Goodbye. <laughs> okay. This was fun. Yeah, it was fun. So I'll see you next time. I'll You'll, see you, you next do it time. Again. Okay. Okay. Thanks. All right. See you. Bye. Bye.